Mwah. All right. So we're going to move into meditation. Nina is going to lead us in singing uh, Surely the Presence. So we invite you to relax, remove everything from your lap, and breathe deeply. deeper into this time of conscious contact with the Lord of our being, I invite you to breathe deeply, soften your body, and breathe. Breathing in the pure power and presence of God, breathing out, letting go, and creating more space for God to be God in you. Breathing in love, breathing out, letting go, breathing in peace, breathing out and letting go, breathing in abundance, breathing out and letting go, breathing in health and wholeness. Breathing out, letting go. Breathing in joy and happiness. And breathing out, letting go. Meditation is a opportunity for surrender, an opportunity to let go, to release our own judgments and fears and worries and opening up to a divine idea an idea of love and peace and harmony and joy that replaces any fear or discordance or idea that we are separate from one another or from God Today, we practice loving kindness, not only because we need it for ourselves, but because the world needs it. And so we breathe into our hearts and we awaken this energy and this idea of loving kindness, a way of being in the world that brings harmony and order and joy to others, an idea that brings peace and wholeness and all good things to ourselves. So as I share these affirmations of loving kindness, I invite you to repeat them to yourself inwardly and allow the energy and the thought and the truth of these statements to resonate within you. And we begin with ourselves by affirming these statements for ourselves as we awaken these ideas within us and then we can give them away to others. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be safe from harm. May I be safe from harm.
May I be healthy and well. May I be healthy and well. May I be happy. May I be happy. And as we allow these statements and this truth to wake up within us, we open our hearts wider to include a loved one, to include our friends and families, and bring an image of them into your mind's eye and let us affirm, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be safe from harm. May you be safe from harm. May you be healthy and well. May you be healthy and well. May you be happy. May you be happy. And taking a deeper breath and opening our hearts a little wider, this is the one that challenges us the most. But it is the Christ teaching to love our enemies. So I invite you to bring into your mind and into your heart someone who challenges you. Maybe it's someone in your close circle who has different beliefs than you. Maybe it is the shooter from yesterday's tragedy. Someone who is hard to love. And as the Christ does, we love them unconditionally. And we affirm, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be safe from harm. May you be safe from harm. May you be healthy and well. May you be healthy and well. May you be happy. May you be happy. And taking a deeper breath and opening your heart as wide as the world. This time we include all beings. Two-legged, four-legged, winged, those that creep and crawl on the earth or swim in the oceans and fly in the sky. All living beings. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be safe from harm. May you be safe from harm. May you be healthy and well. May you be healthy and well. And may you be happy. May you be happy. And let's spend some extended time in the silence in this truth.
And as we gently bring our awareness back to this time and place, being blessed by these affirmations, I ask you to affirm them after me out loud. I am filled with loving kindness. Together? I am filled with loving kindness. I am safe from harm. Together? I am safe from harm. I am healthy and well. I am healthy and well. I am happy. I am happy. We give thanks and we pray all of this in the name and in the nature of the indwelling Christ presence. And so it is. Amen. I am strong when I am on your 
to more than I can be. Once upon a time, as a man was walking through the forest, he saw a tiger peering out at him from the underbrush. And as the man turned to run, he heard the tiger spring after him to give chase. Barely ahead of the tiger, running for his life, our hero came to the edge of a steep cliff. Clinging onto a strong vine, the man climbed over the edge just as the tiger was about to pounce. Hanging over the cliff, the side of the cliff, with the hungry tiger pacing above him, he looked down and to his dismay saw another tiger down there at the bottom of the ravine. And all of a sudden, at that time, he saw this little mouse come out of the rocks and started to gnaw on the vine that he was hanging on to. And at that precise moment, the man noticed a patch of wild strawberries growing out of a clump of earth right there on the edge of the cliff. Reaching out, he plucked the strawberry, and it was perfect, perfectly ripe, warmed by the sun, and he ate it. And it was the most perfect delicious strawberry he had ever had. End of the story.
<laughs> That's a Zen koan, so you just have to sit with it. Think about all the scenarios that are going on, right? What's going to happen? Is the vine going to break? The tiger going to get him from below? Is he going to crawl back up and the tiger is going to get him from above? Or is some miracle going to happen where he lets go and he flies off and all is well? Yeah, so this is how we think, right? We, we have anxiety about the future. We have worry about the past. Or we can be in the present moment, in the here and now. This is the place where God is in this moment, in the taste of that perfect strawberry. That is the eternal moment, and life is made up of these eternal moments, right? Our work is to stay in this eternal moment to where the full presence of God is. And from this, this place, from that wisdom, we are informed with what the next step is for our lives. And that's our work, right? It's, it's, and sometimes it's challenging. Think, we think about how much from the past affects what happens in the, in the present moment, and then we worry about the future. And I am as guilty as anybody about having those kind of thoughts. You know, I think about aging as I turn 62 years old this year. And my body is a little bit different than it used to be. I played golf on Friday, and I spent the afternoon healing from around the golf. <laughs> Got my ice packs out, <laughs> and that was it. I was done for the day. Of course, I hadn't played in three or four months. So, you know, just putting my body through those motions was interesting. But, you know, it's different than when I played around the golf you know, 10 or 20 years ago, where I was ready to play again the next day. So I worry sometimes about my body as, as much as I do to take care of it. It's still this aging process that uh, I haven't seemed to be, be able to change. <laughs> I'm having that experience. And I have worries about what our world is going through. You know, we're living in a different world. I see you shaking your head. Those of us who have a couple, few more years behind us know that this, this world is just different and it's different for our young people. You know, the technology, the things that happened yesterday. Yes, those things have been happening for a while, but they seem to be, that's the third or fourth random shooting that has happened in a supermarket in the last year in our country. These things, it's different. And uh, I worry about, for my child and for other, for kids, you know, what is the world that they're, they're growing up in? So I'm, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm still susceptible to having those thoughts and worrying about the future. As you know, we are in transition in this ministry, and we worry about what's going to happen with this ministry. Where are we going to be in a few months? Where will our services be held? And, and all the questions that come along with that, you know, I have these moments when I worry about that. But I also remember that this is the time and place where God is. This is the time and place where the solutions are because the solutions are in God and God is in this moment. So the spiritual journey is for me about in get, getting closer to that presence of God. And it's really something I just do in my mind and in my consciousness because there's no place we can be that is outside the circle of God's love. But my work is to remember that and to remember my oneness in God and not the separation that the world brings about. So last week I saw this piece about what is happening in the churches and in the evangelical, more fundamentalist churches and what this report was about, that people are flocking from the evangelical churches into a more, even further 
forgive the political term, but further right, further more into more fundamentalism, which means that they're believing more in what's going on in the political discourse and in the material world and moving away from the roots of the mystery of their spiritual and religious teachings. This is what's happening. There are books written by people who are inside that movement who are seeing it happen, that we're believing more in what's going on in the world than our faith allows us to believe in the perfection of God's plan and God's dream for the world. And so I, I think about the, the thinking that is behind that. What is the thinking that people are believing more in separation, more in, uh, I don't know, how, how an 18-year-old can do what he did yesterday, believing, you know, he wrote a manifesto about it, believing this, this conversation that people, because their skin color is different, that they are different and not as worthy of God's love as they are. I mean, this kid is going to be locked up for the rest of his life because he believed that. Someone taught him that, and he believed it. And it's not true. It's not true. The color of your skin doesn't make you less worthy of God's love. We are all created in the image of God. So these stories and these beliefs, we have to stand up to the truth, and we have to remember that we are all children of God worthy of God's love. And that's why we have to get deeper into our spiritual teachings, deeper into the truth of the mystery, that the mystery is good and that God is still in charge. There's a term that we use, it's, it's similar to unity, and it's called non-duality. And non-duality is about believing in our oneness in God, not that there is God and us, that there is only God and we are all a part of it. Non-duality is a, 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 a philosophy which says that there is just one eternal spirit in existence, and that everything in the universe is, in, is an inseparable part of it. Just one eternal spirit in existence, and that everything in the universe is an inseparable part of it. Sorry, that's hard words for me to say, but not hard words for me to believe. Non-duality is the experience of intimacy with all things, a sense of identity with the entire universe. In this experience, the sense of being a witness or seer of things vanishes completely, and instead, you feel yourself to be whatever you are beholding. You don't see the mountain, you are the mountain. You don't hear the music, you are the song. And so it's that sense that we're, we're all one, we're all together in this beloved energy of God, that we're held in this energy of God. So it's kind of like if you imagine the sky and it's hidden by the clouds of all the different shapes and sizes and these clouds constantly move and change their shape. And it is only when they disappear and disperse that you can see the blue sky. But the blue sky is always there. And it doesn't change. It's only the clouds that give us the illusion that something has changed. And so it is with thoughts of separation, of thoughts of difference. When we, when we think that stuff, it's just an illusion because we are one in God. And that is our spiritual work to get back to that oneness, to feel that love, to know how blessed we are in every moment. And this is why Jesus is our way shower and teacher and elder brother, because he knew it. He knew it when he said, I and my father are one. I and my father are one. And he came to teach us that. He came to teach us our oneness in God, that there is no separation. Jesus also said it this way, if anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, he is a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God that he can't see? 
the command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. Because loving a person is loving God. Right? And if you can't love that person, you're not loving God. It's simple. It's clear. And I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening in the world that we all of a sudden think that people aren't of God. You know, yes, people act out because we, we forget. We forget our divinity. We forget who we are. So it's about our faith. It's about our faith in that love of God and living that into everything that we experience in our lives. So this series is called Be Ye Transformed, and today is about renewing our minds. And the way that we renew our minds is by renewing our thinking. That's why unit, what unity is so good at, we, we teach and we practice affirmative thought, affirmative prayer. We pray and affirm what we want, what is, and then what we want becomes what is in our lives when we affirm our oneness. When we affirm our abundance, that's what shows up. You know, um, with what's going on in the church, we, uh, you know, we announced that this property is for sale. And I, I heard that, I wasn't here that day, but I heard there was like a gasp in the room. <gasps> and to me, that was, I know there's so, a lot of connection to this property, which, I mean, this is one of the most beautiful, spiritual, sacred properties I know of. It's, it's so beautiful. And we have such a connection to it. And we don't want to leave it. At the same time, we, we don't know what, what better things are out there. You know, for us to be able to continue and thrive as a ministry, you know, that where we're not operating in the red of the expenses of the property and, and other things, where we can, we, can, we can find a place that still serves everybody because remembering the church is a people. It's not a building. It's not a property. So at some point, we have to be able to be willing to let go of the good for the better, right? And we don't, we don't know what's out there, but it's good. Our faith is that the right and perfect property for this ministry is at hand. We just haven't discerned it yet. And we may not find it through a realtor or through an ad. It may be a miracle that comes. Somebody says, oh, you know what? I have 25 properties, and you can have this one. <laughs> because I love what you do. I love what the message that you carry. And, you know, I love this ministry. I've witnessed these things. The first ministry I was minister of, being the first minister of that ministry, we were given $1.6 million, the funds to build the building on 10 acres of land. And that was a church I walked into. It was there. No mortgage, the kind heartedness of someone who had more money than they needed. And their family, the, the kids said to their mom, mom, you can build them a church. She said, okay, make it happen. And that's the way God works. When we get our mind right and aligned with that God thought, with that abundance, it shows up in our lives. So let's not be devastated that we may have to leave this property. Let's be open to the good. And the same thing in your lives, whatever your challenges is, whether it's a health challenge, a financial challenge, a relationship challenge, affirm the love of God, the abundance of God, and allow that to come into your life and manifest. That's what we do. That's how we get our minds right around this spiritual practice of, 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 of affirmative prayer. Earl Nightingale said it this way. Why do we become what we think about? Well, I'll tell you how it works as far as we know. To do this, I want to tell you about a situation that parallels the human mind. And I love the song that we did, uh, the garden song it speaks to this. Suppose a farmer has some land, and it's good, fertile land. The land gives 
the farmer a choice. He may plant in that land whatever he chooses. The land doesn't care. It's up to the farmer to make a decision. We're comparing the human mind with the land because the mind, like the land, doesn't care what you plant in it. It will return what you plant, but it doesn't care what you plant. Now, let's say that the farmer has two seeds in his hand. One is a seed of corn, the other is a nightshade, a deadly poison. He digs two little holes in the earth and he plants both seeds, one corn, the other nightshade. He covers up the holes, waters and takes care of the land and what will happen? Invariably, the land will return what was planted. The Bible tells us, as we sow, so we shall reap. Remember the land doesn't care. It will return poison in just as wonderful abundance as it will corn. So up come the two plants, one corn, one poison. The human mind is far more fertile, far more incredible than the mysteries of the land, but it works the same way. It doesn't care what we plant, success or failure, a concrete worthwhile goal or confusion, misunderstanding, fear, anxiety, and so on. But what we plant must return to us. We see the human mind is the last great unexplored continent of earth. It contains riches beyond our wildest dreams. It will return anything we want to plant. So the seeds we plant are the thoughts that we hold in mind. And if together, collectively, we multiply that good by affirming the right and perfect place for this ministry, it may be this place, 2.1 million, get out your check. <laughs> it may be this place, it may be something better. So if we can hold that thought in mind, this is what we are going to experience in our lives. Hypatia Housebrook, a unity minister, wrote it this way. Positive prayer is the way to form a permanent attitude of mind that reflects the eternal benevolent activity of God so that we may truly express our nature as children of God created in God's image to express God's likeness here on earth. So here are the steps we take to do this. We, we stay in the here and now as much as possible. We don't regret the past or worry about the future, but we stay in the present moment where all things are possible. We practice non-duality, knowing our oneness in God, that there is no separation as much as we see it or feel it. We know that we are one in God. And we love each other like you, like, like the other is you. There's a, um, a yoga teaching that says just that, the other is you. So, you know, what we do to the other is what we experience and what the other does is what they experience, that we are one. There's only one of us in the mind of God. So we learn to practice loving each other as if they were God. What would that be like for you, especially those who challenge us the most? And that's what Mother Teresa did, right? How did she do the work that she did her entire career was that she saw the face of God in every homeless person, every AIDS-stricken body she picked up that was laying in the gutter, filthy, disgusting. She saw the face of God in them. And it was that love and that idea that helped those people to have some dignity and maybe to live and uh, turn their lives around. So stay in the here and now, practice non-duality and love each other and see the face of God in everyone. I wanna close with this uh, scripture from Paul from Philippians. Summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'd do best by filling your minds and meditating on these things. 
true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Put into practice what you learned from me, what you heard and saw and realized. Do that, and God, who makes everything work together, will work you into the most excellent harmonies. Gospel according to Bob and Ted. I'm glad somebody got it. But that's actually written by Paul. And what I love about this, this is where the rubber meets the road. Paul was in prison when he wrote that. Imagine being in the worst circumstances of your lives and having the attitude to look for the good, to pray and pay attention to the things that are right in the world. I love the idea of like catching your children doing something right. You know, so often we get a mindset where we're always correcting and redirecting. Catch people doing something right and celebrate that. So here we are in one of the most beautiful church campuses that we know of, and yet there is something even better out there waiting for us. And again, it could be this, and it could be something else. But if we hold to that truth, letting go of our attachment to fear or worry or lack, we're going to manifest something amazing. And not only can we do that here as a community, we can do that in our own personal lives. So let's take a moment to know this inwardly. So dear, loving Father, Mother, God, as we breathe into this space and into this moment, we feel your love. We know your truth, that we are divinely blessed, that all things are working for our good. So we are open and receptive to receive the kingdom, to receive the blessings of creation, to manifest them in our lives and in this ministry and in the world. And as we do this, we know that peace will prevail. We know that love will prevail. We give thanks and pray this in the name and in the nature of the indwelling Christ presence. And so it is. Amen.